Hey, Starship Addicts, my name is Zach Golden, and welcome to another episode of CSI Starbase. Welcome to CSI Starbase. This week, I have some pretty heavy speculation for you guys related to one Starship vehicle in particular that I think a lot of you still have some sort of emotional attachment to. Which one am I referring to? Well, I'm talking about the orbital class booster that almost was, booster number four. We're also gonna talk about a mystery addition to the side of the mega bay, which if my theory proves true, could provide for one of the most epic views in all of Starbase. And of course, I wouldn't be living up to my name if I didn't have an important stage zero update for you guys. So let's go ahead and hop right into this week's episode. So as a little review, most of you have probably heard by now that SN16 finally met its demise recently when it was moved out of the rocket garden and over to the mega bay where it was swiftly cut into two sections. In this shot from Carlos Nunez, we can see the nose cone in the scrapyard after all of its internal components that SpaceX might be able to reuse were removed. Later that day, Chief from the What About It channel caught this image of SN16's tank section sitting outside of the mid bay awaiting further scrappage. Shortly after this, Ship 20 was transported to the Rocket Garden with its tiles facing Highway 4 as most of us were hoping for. To top off a busy week of vehicle shuffling, Booster 7 was moved to the Mega Bay to begin receiving its long-awaited Raptor 2 engines. It's been far too long since the last time we have seen a static fire. Luckily, the incredible engineers at SpaceX were able to repair B7 to allow it to move to this next stage. It would have been a pretty major setback to have to scrap B7 and start all over again with B8. Now, with that boring review stuff out of the way, let's talk about Booster 4. It's currently sitting in the same location at the launch complex as it's been ever since B7 was rolled out for the first time. It's pretty clear that we shouldn't expect to see any further action out of this booster. Retirement is just around the corner, so I've been on the lookout for signs of where it might end up next. The most obvious location would be at the Sanchez site. As you can see though, there isn't a lot of room here. When we look around the perimeter of the site, we can see various structures being assembled and also a ton of space being taken up for storage of other parts that either haven't been given a home yet or in a lot of cases may never get used here at Starbase due to changes in designs and overall site plans. When we look next to the Booster 5 staging pad, we can see that they just might be able to fit another large display stand here, but so far it doesn't look like any preparations for that are underway. So maybe the plan is to scrap B5 and let Booster 4 take its spot. I for one would not mind that at all, because Booster 5 is basically an unfinished vehicle that has zero noticeable accomplishments under its name, just like SN16. And look at what they did to that guy. Also, if you're going to store a booster for public viewing, you might as well make it one with Raptors installed on it, right? I'm sure most of you will agree with that as well. But you know, who am I to go signing B5's death certificate before SpaceX does? Maybe there's another option. I actually have an idea which is highly speculative but I think there is a solid chance. It came to me while I was watching a recent live stream from Jessica Kirsch. If you haven't subscribed to her channel already, I highly recommend it as Jessica is always in the right place at the right time. And without her and other photographers on the ground, I wouldn't be able to make observations like these. So one thing I noticed while watching this footage was heavy machinery being used to compact the dirt in an area that appears to be just below ship 20 from this angle. I also noticed a convoy of trucks offloading dirt for several hours and building up the ground around the site. I counted just over 10 trucks in that hour, so this is a very large amount of dirt. I really needed some more angles of this so I could figure out what was going on, but I didn't want to interrupt Jessica's stream just to get it. I mean, literally it's a pile of dirt. Luckily, Mauricio from RGV Aerial just so happened to catch another angle of this while he was out there the same day. You can see here that the land has been significantly raised up from the level of the paved road just in front of it. With the rate that they've been adding dirt to this location, I really get the vibe that something important is supposed to go here very soon. Looking at this from the aerial view, there are a few items laying around nearby that could explain what this area is going to be used for. Now, this could be some kind of weird storage wars coincidence, but when you look closely, you can see this large pile of rebar laying nearby, along with nine large steel embeds. For those who don't know what these are, if we add just three more of them and mix it together with the pile of rebar, this is what you get a booster storage pad. In this image taken from last year, you can see what it looks like before the concrete is added. Although there is a high probability that this might not happen, I think this would be an amazing location to extend the rocket garden out to. In some ways, it actually makes even more sense because there are more locations for visitors to park along the container wall. So who knows, maybe in the next few weeks we will see Booster 4 posted up right here. 
I think a lot of you would be excited to see this as well, but don't go getting your hopes up too high only to have them crushed and then come calling me out on Twitter if it doesn't happen. Anyways, returning to Jessica Kirsch's live stream outside of the Mega Bay, there was another interesting observation that I made while watching workers install tensioning rods for additional structural stability prior to mounting the roof panels. I was looking for signs of the missing stairwell, which is something I'll explain in a future episode, when Jessica zoomed out to see two random beams being installed on the side of the building. I watched this for quite a while because the placement of these beams made absolutely no sense to me. They definitely stand out compared to all the other structural supports surrounding them though. In this shot from RGB ground drill, taken from the other side of the building a few days later, we can see that these beams only exist on one side of the structure. I decided to look at the high bay to see if there's anything similar, and this was the only thing I could find. What you're looking at is one of two balconies at the top of the high bay. As you can see, the entire balcony essentially rests on this one beam. So once again, this may or may not happen, but I promise that I will be on the lookout for it. And if y'all happen to see it before I do, make sure you tag me on Twitter immediately, where I will likely take it as a personal insult and manually unsubscribe everyone involved. So I do have some ideas on what this might look like, but the two CSI Starbase 3D forensic agents who are assigned to this case are currently taking finals right now. So we're gonna have to wait for them to finish up before I can show you guys what I think it's gonna look like. Or not, if it ends up becoming pretty clear that it's not gonna happen. Anyways, let's move to the stage zero updates for this week because there have been a lot of interesting developments. Okay, first things first, if you've been tuning into the weekly RGV Aerial live streams, which I have linked in the description, you may remember us pointing out these steel panels seen near the ground fabrication building last week at the build site. We were pretty sure that these are destined for the orbital launch mount as 99% of equipment installed under the OLM was stored near this building at some point in time. Lo and behold, a few days later, Chief from the What About It channel caught them arriving to the launch complex on several flatbed trucks. Now, if you happen to catch the first CSI Starbase episode, these may look pretty familiar to you. I'm pretty confident that what we are seeing here is likely an upgrade to the tiny calf muscles, aka flame diverters, that are currently on OLM number one. As I mentioned before, the existing wedge-shaped diverters do not cover the full diameter of the column. This seems a little less effective for reducing the amount of turbulence as the exhaust flow exits from between the legs. When I first saw the change made to the design of the new column, I was curious if these would end up being upgraded at Starbase as well. In my opinion, a change like this is a result of simulation data telling you that it's necessary, especially since, well, we haven't had any static fires yet so far on this OLM, so sim data is really all that SpaceX has. If this is a necessary feature on one launch mount, I would also expect it to be integrated onto the other as well. If you look at them one more time, you can see that they are quite comparable in size. While we're on this subject, I should mention that thanks to Fariel on Twitter, we can see that the first column shown on this truck as it was being delivered is now finally standing upright at pad 39A by the time of this flyover. If you guys haven't followed Fariel on Twitter, then you're missing out on tons of great space flight photography from the Cape. Now, for those of you who are already aware of this, don't worry, because that was not what I wanted to talk to you about today. The major stage zero update for this week is actually something that I suggested would happen in an article I posted on Twitter about two months ago. If you want the full background story, which goes in even more depth, I will be leaving a link to it in the description. But as a quick summary, I basically explained how I noticed that SpaceX was building the sections for this launch tower out of order and why that was necessary. Well, I finally have an important update to that article thanks to some additional airborne photographs of the Robert Road facility taken this week. Looking at the tower sections up close, we can see that we no longer need to be able to recognize the unique features of each tower section in order to tell them apart, because SpaceX basically went and labeled them all for us to make it easier to identify from two miles away. As you can see, after sections one and two were semi-completed, SpaceX skipped over three and four and went straight to assembling section five. But why would they do this? Let's zoom in on sections one, two, and five to see if we can notice anything that might explain this. So there is an interesting detail here that some of you may notice, but I'm gonna skip over it for now and address it in a future episode. Feel free to discuss in the comments if you happen to notice the subtle change in design to these tower sections. Anyways, the thing that stood out immediately to me here was the scaffolding in the middle of the fifth section. Scroll back if you need to, but this isn't present on any of the other sections. This is a sign that some significant additional work that needs to be performed on section five. 
In my opinion, there's really only one possible explanation for this. So let's look at what makes the fifth section so much different than the rest. In this shot from Starship Gazer, the thing that immediately stands out to me is the large amount of lighting in the middle of this tower. The reason this area of the tower is lit up is because there is a ridiculous amount of mechanical systems that are located here, which SpaceX monitors pretty closely during testing events. Just to name a few, we have a large amount of cryogenic pipework transitioning from the tower to the QD arm, a high pressure gaseous methane, nitrogen, oxygen, and helium delivery system for the Starship, a pretty serious hydraulic control system which actuates the left and right arms of the chopsticks, extends and retracts the gigantic reach around arm hanging off the side of the tower, the claw that's used to stabilize the booster, and the ship quick disconnect system. I said I was gonna name a few, but yeah, that's pretty much all of it. In the last CSI Starbase episode, I hinted that construction progress of the new launch tower might actually be a little bit behind schedule. And the reason I believe this is because it's pretty hard to start installing this system into the new launch tower when the redesign of the first one is still in progress. As I mentioned before, the lateral cryogenic locks and methane tubes, which used to look relatively simple in design, received a significant makeover a few weeks ago as a dual filtration system was added into both the liquid oxygen and methane supply lines. In the time since that episode, even more of the system was swapped out and upgraded. And it's still not complete. With all that being said, for weeks I've been looking for signs that we might actually see some fully kitted out tower sections transported to the launch site this time around, instead of a bunch of empty skeletons like we saw at Starbase. Honestly, at this point, I was about to celebrate the scaffolding as a victory when I noticed something in the top of this image showing the foundation of Star Factory number two. I reached out to Fariel to see if she had another angle of this area, and let me tell you, Stage Zero Zack was not disappointed with what she sent back. From this angle, we can see several racks full of cryotubing outside of these tents which were erected adjacent to the tower assembly area. Although pre-assembly appears to only just be getting underway, we can already identify some of the U-shaped expansion loops that are seen in several locations throughout the Starbase launch tower. Expansion loops are a common way to absorb the temperature expansion and contraction in steel pipes. There should be about nine of them in total. Hopefully, next time we see this area, there will be a lot more progress, and even some of the less complicated cryo sections already mounted into sections one through four. This group will be much easier to complete because the cryo tubes located in these sections are basically just simple vertical risers that can be mounted onto a rack and lifted in the section in less than a day without the need for extensive scaffolding. I think relatively soon that the other mechanical pipework will appear as well, but we will have to wait and see on that. The ones I'm referring to can be seen here in this aerial shot before they were installed on the first tower. These pre-assembled racks were all lifted into the tower prior to the ninth section being installed. Using the world's second largest crawler crane to install something like this is just something I don't think we're ever gonna see again on any of the future launch towers that SpaceX will eventually construct. And trust me, I think there are gonna be a lot more of them than most of you are currently expecting. Keep in mind, this is speculation but I like to think of the first launch tower as a pathfinder for figuring out how to build a Starship launch tower. The construction of the second and maybe even the third launch towers are SpaceX's attempt at figuring out how to optimize the process of rapidly manufacturing entire launch sites. After this, I think we will see another even larger leap where SpaceX might actually be mass producing towers, but this time in a location near or better yet inside of a major shipping port somewhere along the Gulf Coast and then mailing them to various locations around the world like it's f***ing FedEx or something. Ideally, this port would also be extremely close to the location where the structural steel needed for these towers is being fabricated. For rapid mass production, it would make sense logistically to reduce the distance between the fabrication facility and the shipping origin as much as possible. Anyways, that was quite the tangent. Back to the point. This is what I'm expecting the first four tower sections to look like the day they are lifted into place. You can see here that there's just a tiny gap left over between the pipes where the couplings can be installed to connect each section together. Those smaller parts can easily be wheeled into a construction elevator inside of the tower and won't require a super crane for installation. SpaceX should likely be able to pre-install the rails for the construction elevator as well. Here's a look at how they attach to the structural beams in the center of the tower. These types of steps are gonna be very important if SpaceX wants to complete this tower in less than a year because that's how long it's taken for the first one. Some of you may be thinking, wow, these sections are gonna be significantly heavier and might require SpaceX to bring in an even bigger crane this time around for stacking the tower sections. 
Well, I'm no crane expert, far from it actually. But when looking back at this RGV aerial photo to see how many counterweights the LR11350 had to use while lifting the fifth section of the tower, you can see that there were actually a large amount of these counterweights that weren't being used. So unless there's something I'm missing here, which is totally possible, I think this crane should easily be able to handle the additional weight of these sections, and we probably won't be seeing the bigger brother of this super crane at Pad 39A. All right, Starship Addicts, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. So if you guys enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss out on the next one. And if you guys want more daily updates about things that I don't have time to cover in these episodes, be sure to follow me on Twitter as well. I want to give a special shout out to those of you who have already been supporting the channel so far. Your donations are going a long way into helping me make important upgrades to the studio, specifically in the lighting department, so I don't have to spend all summer reverse tanning in the shade just to make this green screen work. But before I go, I want to show you this awesome photo taken by CSI Starbase field agent Max Q on a recent Kennedy Space Center bus tour. Max Q traveled all the way from Wales in the UK just to get this one photo of the launch tower sections under construction at the Roberts Road facility. If you look closely, you can see that the exterior paneling has been added onto four of the tower section. This is exactly the same paneling that was installed on the first OLIT, which is actually meant to protect the large cable chain that follows the chopsticks up and down the tower. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then be on the lookout for a future Twitter post, which will probably go live shortly after this episode, and I'll give you guys a little short explanation on what exactly this is. In the meantime, see you guys next week, and thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of CSI Starbase.